Today's episode of the Bitcoin Show is brought to you by usgoldcoins.com, 1-800-HOT-COIN, and Mezzy Grill, M-E-Z-E, grill.com, and tradehill.com, and mtgox.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Bitcoin Show for Wednesday, July 21st. It's 2 p.m. Eastern. Well, a little bit late. We're starting a little bit late. Today's episode 27. I'm Bruce Wagner. This is Manny Mena. And today we have a special guest, uh, Donald Norman from Inter. Uh, well, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us. Okay, so where you're from. <laughs> my name is uh, my name is Donald Norman, and uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a member of the Bitcoin Consultancy, a co-founder. But uh, on this show, mostly I'm here to promote Intersango right now. But there's so many things to talk about, so. Okay, so uh, Intersango.com um, is, is sort of a new name for something that s other people may have heard of before. Well, it's, not a, it's not a new name. No? It's um, the software was released and under Intersango, and it's a software that Britcoin, which I think in the history um, for the last six months or so has been the third or fourth highest volume site. Um, mm. but, uh, but the British pound only has sort of, you know, a smaller share of the market. Uh, but the site's been in operation since at least March. We've done a lot of volumes. There was a 24 hour period where, since everyone thinks in dollars, I'm gonna say we did about uh, $35,000 worth of, you know, Bitcoin trade. Um, and- uh, Daily? That was, yeah, and daily um, we've had you know, weeks where every day we've had fifteen thousand dollars worth or ten uh, ten thousand pounds worth. Oh, no. I'm sorry to interrupt, but let me let me make sure I'm clear that. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about okay, Bitcoin is the sorry. oldest entity, right? Yeah, Brit I, I, Bitcoin. I Bitcoin is the site, oh, okay. and it's the site, and it's the site name, and it's the British exchange. It's a play on words, but the software that site was using was called Intersango, ah. which was also developed in-house okay. by Amir Taki. Okay. And um, you know, it was sort of his side project. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to create an open source platform, an open source software, so that basically anyone could go open a business bank account and um, you become know, start an site. and become an exchange site. Yeah. And uh, he's a programmer. He's been working in free software for 10 years um, since, and he's, you know, he's been doing that professionally. Um, and he's been involved with uh, you know core Bitcoin development for a long time. So Intersango is the software that runs uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin, yeah. And, and Bitcoin is and, and it's free open source software. It's uh, yeah. Not only is the software open source, but the site has been free. Um, it you know it takes us a lot of time and there's some overhead, but uh, it's it's free. We haven't. You mean no exchange fees at all. There's no exchange fees. There's no deposit fees. There's no withdrawal fees. There's absolutely no fees. What so like okay? That's for Bitcoin. That's for Bitcoin and Intersango. The, the reason um, when we're expanding, we can't uh, ha make a USD site, a US dollar site, and call it Bitcoin. It wouldn't make too much sense. So mm -hmm. we chose to go with the, the name Intersango, which mm -hmm. is an Esperanto name for um, exchange. So Esperanto, and people. if you know what Esperanto is, I, 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 I was reminded what it was by Donald last night when we talked, but uh, Manny didn't know what it was. Yeah, so Google Esperanto, idea. that's a whole other story. It's on Wikipedia. Yeah. It's a, it's a uh, newly, or not new, it's, a, it's a, an invented language for global communication. Right. So anyway, but back to this. Let me start, let's start at the beginning. When did Bitcoin first launch? Um, so I don't know the exact, exact launch date. Basically, like I said, Amir wanted to give people in the UK an mm -hmm. opportunity to buy and sell bitcoins, mm -hmm. and um, it's uh, it's a code that he worked on, sort of like I said, as a side project. Mm -hmm. And I know it's been in operation at least since March. Okay. Um, at that's least since March, which is like March. ten years in Bitcoin years. Yeah. Okay. So and uh, and you know we've we've something we have something like over three thousand. Um, I believe it's over three thousand now you know, unique users. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've traded in the last month, we've traded what about 150,000 um, US dollars worth. Oh, US dollars? I, I don't know, is Bitcoin charts always in denominating US dollars? Um, I think I think so. I don't know. 
Um, well, it depends, I guess, on the exchange, but the most popular would be USD. Yeah. And uh, so, so at least 150,000 USD, um, you know, in the last 30 days, I think that's what uh, Bitcoin charts has us at. Yeah. And, um, but we've been, you know, even the month before, um, okay. a lot and yeah. And what, what role do you play at Bitcoin? So I'm not, I'm not a developer. Um, I handle the logistics. Um, but, uh, but I'm also handling, um, just uh, coordinating the team, coordinating everything, doing marketing. Uh, the consultancy is another thing that we're doing. Basically, Amir, uh, when Bitcoin started getting popular, uh, Amir started getting a lot of requests um, to do certain things to mm -hmm. commercially develop Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And um, we were approached by a lot of investors. And he, that's, that's when, I, when I sort of got in play. I've been really good friends with Amir for a long, long time. And, um, and he knew he could trust me and, you know, I've been doing some business things myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I got on board. More the business end of it. Yeah. And, and Amir's a British gentleman. That's right. right that's okay. right. And you're an American guy. And I'm an American guy. Living in England. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, I'm sort of living, I'm sort of globe hopping. Oh, okay. Um, but the thing is, is, uh, is so we end up dealing a lot with, um, with uh, doing a lot of negotiations with clients, and, and mm -hmm. we still are, and developing uh, code specifically for clients, and that's what the consultancy does. The consultancy develops code for clients, and doing that gave us an idea about a lot of things. A lot of mm -hmm. clients um, are, are, were interested in Bitcoin, and then they realized Bitcoin at its current state isn't really that scalable. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the concept is perfect, the security is perfect, but uh, the way Bitcoin was written, it wasn't written in a really a versatile manner. And so Amir... Um, you mean the Bitcoin client? The actual client, yeah, mm -hmm. the actual mm -hmm. client. Mm -hmm. um, and Amir, like for instance, uh, I, I don't know, I haven't actually downloaded the, the newest patch, mm -hmm. but, um, but I know in the old one, you know, you, you click it and you have to wait quite a while just for the GUI to pop up. That should mm -hmm. be the first thing. Mm -hmm. And there's just so many... Um, so many things that needs to be done, but, but the way that the entire code base is, it's really not versatile. It's really not segregated in sections. It really needs to be... Um, like modular? Exactly, modular. And that's what um, LibBitcoin, which is a Bitcoin library, mm -hmm. hopes to do. Lib Bitcoin. Is Lib that, Bitcoin. Is that library for JSON, which is, you know, like the back end of the Bitcoin protocol? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, well, it, I mean... Um, like I said, I'm, I'm actually not a programmer, but um, it's, it's in multiple languages, um, depending on the, the functions of the specific um, processes. And, uh, and uh, there was, I think just uh, yesterday, Amir sort of um, released, you know, all the works that, that he's done on it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and there was a bitcoin.org slash SMF forum post about it. And uh, that's, this is something that in the long term, Bitcoin is definitely going to converge towards. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, th so I'm starting to get the picture. The uh, actually, can you bring up my screen, Ed? The so uh, Bitcoin is the original exchange, and yeah. then the software was released as free open source. The software yeah. that runs the exchange was released as free open source. And it's called Intersango. That's right. Intersango.com. That's right. And now you're kind of rebranding the exchange to the same name, Intersango.com. That's right. So I see Bitcoin actually redirects to to uh, inter well, it's it's now called Intersango which is the same as intersango.com, right? Well, right now um, we have the site separate. Intersango.com is mm -hmm. the Euro site, oh. which um, has only sort of opened up 10, 10 days ago. And we've only had trading in the last five days mm. and um, we're doing pretty okay. And then the US site, intersango.us, which I don't think we've even had our first trade yet, even though it accepts Douala mm -hmm. um, and, it's, um, and uh, it also accepts bank transfers, ACH. Mm -hmm. um, although I think just today we put that up, mm -hmm. and um, and it's completely free. Okay, so cool. completely so free. No trading. Fees. And it's by the all. same. It's the same guys that have run, run Bitcoin. It's free, just like Bitcoin. No trading commission. No deposit. No withdrawal. You know. Wow. No, no so price. many questions. Okay. What's your plan for profitability? Um, well, right now, one thing that we we want to do is is um, we want to find some investment that'll you know maintain the overhead. Um, but the overhead isn't a problem. We've already had uh, some offers, but we're holding out for a little bit of better, better offers. Um, we want to keep the site free as long as possible. I mean, if you look at, you know, Facebook and um, YouTube, 
um, there's and so, for something like this, it, it makes sense to stay free for a long time. Mm -hmm. We're also being incredibly legally diligent. Mm -hmm. um, we've had you know sp specific communication with the FCC, and um, which is I'm sorry the um, FTC. F I'm sorry no I'm sorry the FSA. Oh FSA. Which is the um, which is the UK. Okay. Um, the UK regulatory body. Uh, and uh, and in the U in the US, you know, I've, I've I've spoken to an attorney. I've spoken to. We have our own attorney in the UK who's working full time for us, um, mm -hmm. for free. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, um, you know, they see what we're doing and they they want to donate. They want to support us. So we've had actually a lot of support. But uh, but because we're not bringing in capital and because we have limited resources, there's only so much um, we can get in terms of exposure. Mm -hmm. But um, but I think it's it's important that people know that we're doing this. That we have a history of reliability and security. Even though this code was sort of, you know, Genjix's side project, there have been, you know, no hacks. There is, like I said, a, been a history of reliability and security. There's also been a history of really good support. And Genjix is... And we have, we have a person okay. just doing support. Okay. And Genjix is on Mirtaki. Okay. How many people are on the team altogether? So right now we have um, actually uh, three main developers. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a person doing support. We have a lawyer and myself. Okay, awesome. Yeah, it's services. And those are all full time. Oh wow. We also we've also paid. Um, I know we've paid one person someone something like twenty bitcoins, which is about at that time or whatever three hundred bucks. Okay. So for um, for improvements that he did to the to the site. So we're also trying to trying to pay people mm -hmm. who are adding you know so then when they add, add code or improve the site is it um, that is that going right into the open source um, yeah as yeah. well okay grassroots uh, efforts like these are going to be very important for yeah. you know Bitcoin's future and stability because if people aren't using it you know how is it going to survive mm -hmm. another thing another thing that's really important is creating an infrastructure which is really safe and um, and the thing is is we're, our faces are out there, our names are out there. We've been in a lot of press um, representing the consultancy, representing Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and we're not going to do anything, you know, fraudulent. Mm -hmm. um, we're also not taking risks. We're not taking risks with the laws. We're not taking risks uh, in terms of franchising or expanding too fast. Mm -hmm. uh, all the Bitcoin sites that we own, all the bank accounts are owned by us and operated by us. Um, and uh, and it's it's not franchised in a way that oh you know you come you give us five thousand dollars and we give you the franchising rights mm -hmm. and you know it's in our terms of conditions that you need to worry about the licensing agreements you know if you end up stealing the money or something it's it's on you mm -hmm. um, this is this is something that this is our face this is everything that we're doing is us we've had no security problems. In fact, we've been very progressive in the security field with exchanges. Mm -hmm. um, we were the ones that noticed uh, a lot of the a lot of the you know trouble at MT Gox um, before it be before it was solved. And um, but I don't want to comment. I don't want to comment too much about that. But it is, it's an exchange actually run by programmers. It's a free exchange. And um, and there's no reason it shouldn't be entirely competitive. What kind of headway have you guys been making security-wise uh, that would differentiate you from, you know, other exchanges? Secure. Well, for instance, I was talking to a pretty prominent member of, of Bitcoin the other day, and uh, he was he was saying, well, okay, um, you know, he's being critical of our exchange, and he was saying he was reading in the uh, fine print on our exchange, mm -hmm. you know, this is um, you know whatever alpha software. Um, we really want to make sure if there is, um, you know, once you have your bitcoins, you know, preferably take take them off the site. Now, when I had my bitcoins on Empty Gox, it didn't say that. Mm -hmm. But I had bitcoins on Empty Gox, but because I have access to really good programmers, they told me, you know, you shouldn't keep your bitcoins on Empty Gox. So I took it off, yeah. not because of what was said on the site. You you shouldn't read the site based on the the specific fine print. Right. Uh, in that sense, you should read the site based on its history of reliability. It doesn't matter how secure our website is. No matter how secure our website is, we would want people to basically, if they're not going to be exchanging bitcoins, once they've already purchased their bitcoins, 
to put them, especially if they, you know, understand security themselves, to keep them in the client. I think everyone knows that. And so that's just something that, that we're providing. What you should look at is our history of reliability, our history of the fact that, you know, we've responded to support in timely manners, we fixed all problems. When there were possible concerns, we were almost always the first to notice those possible concerns. We, put, we took down the site to, to address them, even though they weren't um, price matching or, you know, potential hacks. Um, we took down the site now before now um, there were there were multiple different problems with empty gogs and uh, one of them was the email the email issue and people they were able to re-divert a new password to the email I'm not sure the exact specifics but um, we personally had a friend it had been going on for I don't know how long but over a week uh, we personally had a friend report that his money was gone and our security specialist looked into it and in about 30 minutes he found out what it was and we tried to contact Mark from Empty Gox for a while, and we couldn't do it. Later on, when we tried to contact Mark's, Mark later, um, we tried to contact him vigorously for hours. We were able to find a friend of his um, in France who hadn't spoken to him in, in a year, and we talked to him, yeah, is there any way we could contact Mark, before we made it public. We didn't make the exploit public, we just made uh, public that there was an exploit, and with this email, with this the the email one, um, yeah, we we end up having to make it public that oh there is something really wrong. Try to get Mark to contact us, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, you know Mark said okay I fixed the bug. He didn't take the site down as far as I know for that for that time. He fixed the bug, and then um, and then uh, what what was it? Was it actually fixed at that point? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he fixed that, and then he made a statement saying, "Oh, you know, no one has no one's account was actually compromised due to this method." But um, the truth is, is that if you look at the reports, uh, it was pretty obvious that a lot of people's accounts were compromised. And later, he rescinded that statement. Later, he he changed it. Um, but uh, but that friend of ours who did get hacked has recently he had ten bitcoins, which at that time was valued at two hundred dollars. And um, he's been recently told, yeah, sorry, um, you're not going to get your Bitcoins back. I don't know the exact explanation, but he's not going to get his Bitcoins back. So You mean, mean he had uh, 10, he or she had 10 Bitcoin he, on, uh, on, on, Gox. on empty Gox. Mm -hmm. It was in, denominated in US dollars, so mm -hmm. it was $200 or whatever. Uh, and uh, that account was, was uh, compromised due to you know, negligence, possibly criminal negligence. And, um, but anyways, I, I don't want to, you know, drift on that too long, but the whole point is, is that, is that we do have a, uh, you know, history of reliability. We don't have the funds to market ourselves, but um, we're providing a free service and we want to provide a free service for as long as possible. We're also being very diligent, legally speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, we have a full-time lawyer in the UK, Jason Chia. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I think when investors and the investors we're talking to, yeah, they're really interested. Okay, you've followed all the laws, especially in the know your customer laws. You, you know, you've maintained amazing, you know, security, and you have a very good branded name. Mm -hmm. The only thing we don't have is actual awareness, mm -hmm. and that's partially why I'm here and I'm trying to promote Intersango. So to be clear, the, um, Intersango is is uh, even though um, it's free, there are no fees, yeah. and uh, the software is free open source and all that. It's not a charity. This is actually a for-profit enterprise. The, the, it's just a business model like YouTube or Facebook or whatever, yeah. where you're offering the services free and you're actually yeah. open source the software. But ultimately the plan is that um, eventually once it really takes hold and, and grows and gets uh, market share, then there will be fees. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, but if you looked at like Facebook or YouTube, I mean, it was a long time before they were, mm -hmm. before they, they started okay. doing commission. And uh, if we go with investor, we're going to, first of all, if we get a lot of, if we got a lot of capital, we're going to, we accept donations for one, but if we get a lot of capital, we're going to be able to, um, you know, make this run for a lot longer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of companies that actually even operate in the red. Yeah. And, time, um, sure. and based on the amount of money that Bitcoin, the British site, has, um, we can generate not a, not a negligible amount of um, interest from that. Oh, interest yeah. on the dollars that are sitting in there. In the bank account. Oh, okay. Well, that's interesting. So, and, and another thing that we might be able to do is we might be able to add additional features. For instance, Skype, person-to-person -person calling on Skype is free, 
but certain additional features cost money. So we're, we want to try to keep it free for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to try to make it competitive. Right now it is competitive, and I know we only just opened the US site just a little while ago, so I, I don't expect people to all of a sudden flock to it, but I, I was pretty surprised at how little attention Mm -hmm. It's receiving. Okay. Well, now, well, now you're getting attention. We're on the show. Yeah. So uh, let me ask you this. Okay, if I'm a, a wealthy investor, or maybe I'm an early adopter, early miner in Bitcoin, I've got you know lots of money sitting there, and I'm I might be interested in investing. What's in it for me? Oh, investing in Inner Sango. Yeah. Um, well, then you'd have to contact us. So we have <laughs> uh, we basically have a very you know. Um, well-organized business plan that is quite complex and I don't want to get into the okay. particularities of that. But obviously the ultimate plan is to make a profit. It's not to be free and yeah. non-profit forever. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, um, you t the, uh, okay, the, the software is free open source. I have so many questions. The software is free open source. Basically anybody can download it. Anybody who can yeah. open a bank account, a business bank account, uh, if you're of legal age and you can open a business bank account wherever yeah. you are in any country, you yeah. could literally set up a site and use this software and brand it yourself and you have an exchange. That doesn't bother you that, that, uh, that this competition can spring up all over the place using your software? Uh, no, not at all because we've had it open source ever since March mm -hmm. and it's been reliable for a long time. Um, you look at Trade Hill, they decide to develop in-house, uh, which is another thing that I, I don't really understand. I mean. Um, the advantage to open source is you got uh, yeah is, of is looking exactly at it. like for instance you know the um, the fact that they're not using the reference uh, the reference code anymore we knew that would already happen because it was you know in the URL or or I don't know whatever but it was pretty obvious that it was manipulatable mm. so the point is is yeah it's open source I don't think that the profitability from exchanges long term has anything to do with the source code. Mm -hmm. um, it's not in the long term. It's not going to be the source code. It's going to be the reliability. It's going to be the secure, secure, security. It's going to be the marketability, and it's going to be the legal diligence. And but so, isn't the source code? Uh, um, I mean, it's tied directly to the security, of course. I mean, that's right. So I mean, that's a one aspect for sure. If you that's right. Really, but really secure. In terms of history, it's we have yeah the long we have yeah. So if you're if you're saying in terms of if you're ter saying in terms of software that the profitability comes from software. If you look at empty Gox, um, and you look at um, the type of problems they've had, even since um, releasing this new software, the, mm. that their new backend or whatever, um, and then you look at our entire history, I think that uh, that it's obviously not the case that um, I don't want to say people don't care about security. I think a lot of it is just awareness. Mm -hmm. But I th but I'm saying in the long term, yeah, it's it's not the software that's going to make yeah. or break the difference. Yeah, profitability has many aspects that go into it. Yeah. Security is one big aspect, and security has many things that go into it. And software is one big aspect of security. Yeah. Obviously, it's not the only one. There's also just the human factor of if, if you're careless with your passwords, if you give too many exactly. people admin rights or whatever exactly. and you're not you're, you're a little bit careless or not not diligent enough yeah. however you want to phrase it um, then you know the best software in the world isn't going to help you if you're if you're not really really diligent about the security um, but the software ha being open source is a huge advantage I think because you have a million programmers looking at the code and trying yeah. to find a, a flaw and that's actually people a lot of people think well if you're publishing the code you're giving away the secret or whatever that people could look for a hack, but which is true. Yeah. But the fact is, ninety-nine percent of the people looking at it are trying to solve it and with good intentions. Yeah. And only one percent with ill intentions, right? So I mean, I my my opinion is that the the more open source it is, the more secure it will probably end up being. Yeah, because yeah, anybody from all over the world could mm -hmm. contribute to it. That's right. Just look at Windows now, versus Linux, right? We're also, we're also developing a version 2 software for Indersango, mm -hmm. which we haven't open source yet. We may in the future open source it. Um, but, but what you just mentioned, a lot of, yeah, a lot of um, business people, they're interested in closed close source, and it's not really our position. What our number one goal is, is to be, um, bring a sense of reliability and uh, legal, a certain legal status to, to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's going on now in some of the other exchanges really worries us. It really worries us and it really can have dramatic effect in terms of 
how Bitcoin gets received by the world for the next however long. I mean, you know, an event that happens at, um, you know, a place that has 90% of the market share of the entire market, uh, exchange market, can cause the whole system of Bitcoin not to be developed in two years, not to be uptaken in two years, but in 10. Right. When, so yeah, one big one big flaw can exactly. affect have a huge ripple effect. Let me let me interrupt. I'm sorry to take a quick break. I've got a lot of questions for you yeah. about the legal compliance things, um, but we have to thank our sponsors because obviously we wouldn't be here without them. And uh, so I'm going to take a really quick moment and thank our sponsors, all of them. Uh, they are usgoldcoins.com. Andy Gauss is a, a brilliant monetary historian and. Um, uh, money expert. He's actually my money money guru for all things money. Uh, we He has a national radio program and now he's actually bringing his show to Only One TV every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. starting RSN real soon now. If not this Wednesday, next Wednesday. Anyway, it's coming. It's called The Real World of Money and he's an absolute brilliant, brilliant guy. Super, super knowledgeable and accessible. When you talk about transparency and openness and being reachable, um, he's usgoldcoins.com is his company and you can just pick up the phone and call if you're in the US 1-800-HOT-COIN if you're not in the US just go to usgoldcoins with an s dot com 1-800-HOT-COIN and ask for Andy he is uh, going to help you buy uh, to diversify your investments by rare gold and silver US coins they're called numismatic gold and silver coins as an investment so um, he will help you buy them and get a, a great price and if the need ever occurs that you need to sell them, he'll buy them back. He gives preferential treatment to his own customers, obviously. But I can absolutely vouch, absolutely vouch for him personally, for his integrity and his knowledge. He's beyond compare. That's Andy Gauss at usgoldcoins.com, 1-800-HOT-COIN. We thank him. You know, Call him up or send him an email and thank him for sponsoring the Bitcoin Show, as well as all of our sponsors. And Mezzy Grill. How could you forget M-E-Z-E Grill.com, the world's first brick and mortar restaurant. What other kind of restaurant is there, I guess? Uh, <laughs> brick and mortar, that sounds delicious. Yeah, it's but it's where, <laughs> where authentic Mediterranean food meets modern flavor. It's like uh, it's kind of like a, a Chipotle, but more upscale, and it's uh, much better food. It's, middle, it's med Mediterranean food, super, super healthy. Most of the ingredients are organic and locally grown and sustainable as, as much as possible. Super healthy, one of our nice favorite places. If you're in New York or you're ever traveling and passing through New York, um, find Columbus Circle, um, the very famous southwest corner of Central Park. It's three blocks south, the world's first restaurant to accept Bitcoin. Thank Marwan for sponsoring uh, the Bitcoin Show and Only One TV and Trade Hill. Of course, we all know Trade Hill. TradeHill.com, the uh, the new exchange on the site that offers many, many unique ways to get money in and out. And they have more currencies they're adding all the time. They now deal with euros directly without converting them to the U.S. dollars. So they have their own market specifically for euros, which is cool. And then uh, and also Mt. Gox. MTGOX.com, the uh, number one, I mean, the, the number one market share web, uh, <laughs> online exchange site, of course. Everybody knows Mt. Gox, and um, they are uh, here to stay. So, no matter what uh, your opinion is of their, uh, <laughs> you know, their, uh, their, their recent troubles with their crash and their hack and all that, everything gets hacked. But uh, one thing's for sure, they've been around a long time, they definitely have the market share, and they didn't pack up the Bitcoins and run. They're, they're here, they're resilient, and they're, they're back online. So we thank them for sponsoring the Bitcoin Show. The entire community uh, believes, I think that the entire community believes that the more exchanges, the better. The more uh, diversity we have and the more choices we have, the, the, the better it is for Bitcoin overall. Mm -hmm. Decentralized uh, exchanges. As decentralized as Bitcoin, yeah. So thank all of our sponsors for sponsoring and bringing us to you. So yeah, I have, I have more questions for you. Um, I, I actually yeah, I have a couple things to add. Um, in, terms of, in terms of this version 2 software that we're going to be bringing out, one thing that we hope to do is to make the base open source, but um, certain things like um, Forex capabilities closed source. And the reason is, is because it, uh, we don't want uh, people, um, you know, your sort of kid. We want Bitcoin exchanges to be as decentralized as possible. But we don't. What we don't want is people like, you know, a thirteen-year-old. Thir not a thirteen-year-old. <laughs> I guess. I guess to open a business bank account, you need, you need, you need to be a little bit older. 
but um, we don't want someone, you know, who's 20 years old or whatever to, um, you know, just take the code and open a Forex site and then realize that he's in breach of some serious, you know, mm -hmm. laws. Um, in terms of, uh, I guess I want to say, what, one more thing about Intersango and then, uh, and then move on. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a free site. It's uh, completely free to exchange. It's going to be operating for free as long as possible. We have really good support. And, uh, and I think the problem is just awareness. If you go to Google and you type buy bitcoins, um, I don't think Intersango, I don't know if Intersango is even on the first page. And if you go to, you know, the wiki for Bitcoin, Intersango, it's not even in alphabetical order and Intersango is pretty far down there. Um, so, but, but aside from the exchange, in terms, uh, a couple of other things that I want to hit on is um, what the, yeah, what the business atmosphere is, what the consultancy is trying to do, and um, maybe, you know, possible future adoption, future legal um, implications of Bitcoin. Uh, in terms of the consultancy, like I said, we're trying to promote a lot of software. Um, we've done a lot of software. We, like I said, we did the open source exchange platform software, but we also did a lot of software for the stock exchange. Um, and I, I don't, I don't know exactly what I think. Uh, Amir added a lot to the client code. The stock um, exchange, which stock exchange? Uh, the one Nefario is um, is running. So oh, so Bitcoin stock exchange. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, okay. And okay. then, cool. um, and then uh, what else? Uh, We've done in-house, we've done two different clients. Um, Patrick Straitman released a, released a client and Amir released Spezmilo. Mm. Um, so these are all projects that are done by the Bitcoin Consultancy, yeah, which is bitcoinconsultancy.com. Yeah, and if you go to the consultancy site, we have a list of all of them. Mm -hmm. And the, the recent one that, that, um, that we're working on is, is a lot of people have talked about a library um, and how that's the future of Bitcoin and it's a long-term goal. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way the current Bitcoin code is structured, it's, it's really, you know, Satoshi was an academic. He was a genius. Um, or he is a genius. I'm sure, you know, he's still out there, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he's, a, he's an academic and it's really not versatile. And the, the business people that approached us that said, oh, I want to use Bitcoin to do this and to do that, a lot of their applications were just not possible with the current code and uh, the amount of altercations that would be necessary for Bitcoin to become commercially adopted and if it does get commercially adopted then its status in the world is going to be massive. Um, mm -hmm. If it gets con commercially adopted the interests to promote it, to keep it legal, to keep it um, secure and to, stable and to keep it, scalable. Well I don't think security or, or, or I don't think those are real, really issues, like, um, but to keep it, uh, uh, let's say, having a good name in the public, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to something that's shunned, uh, to keep it like that, there's going to be a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of reasons to move fast. There's a lot of reasons to actually build a library that um, where we're not just adding, you know, patches on something that's, that's um, sort of loosely, you know, I think what you're describing, I mean, for those people who are, I mean, I know you're not a coder, but yeah. um, it's still technical. What you're talking about is the code. And mm -hmm. um, I think what you're saying is that, and what I've heard this before too, that the actual source code for the Bitcoin client yeah. is kind of like, it's written by an academic, not yeah, a coder. It's hard to read. Spaghetti um, code. Yeah, and then follow it. It's, it's a big problem. Yeah. That's if you change one mm -hmm. thing, you have to actually check the entire yeah. thing from A to Z mm -hmm. that you're not affecting I'm, something I'm sure else. Gavin has been working on that because he's a straight up coder mm -hmm. and knows those practices, especially yeah. Since I believe they're on Gitorious and they have to follow certain rules and protocols, mm -hmm. this way the code is more consistent. Yeah. But I'm sure over time that would improve because it is an open source project. That's so right. That's right. I mean, they're, you know, basically a lot of the patches are additions, and uh, there there may be some fixing up the code that's already in place, but um, but really the the patches on top are, would be much faster. They'd be much. Um, they'd take much less reviews. They'd um, and the whole process would be faster. Actually, Gavin, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't want to name specific names, but a lot of people, a lot of the lead developers have said that, uh, yeah, a library for Bitcoin is something that, um, that, that they have as a long-term goal. 
So it's the, a major project because they it is actually a, it like, is a major project. Rewrite the whole thing and basically ditch the original code and completely replace it. It is a major pro project, and a lot of the clients that you know the alternative clients that exist now obviously build off that code, mm -hmm. right? Um, but uh, but it's something that we've been doing for three months now or yeah. something, and um, and yeah, we're all working fourteen hours a day. Amir is working pretty much exclusively on this. 14 hours a day. I wonder if this would happen, I mean, this is kind of what I kind of foresee, I mean, just not really knowing what's going to happen, but um, that if, if alternative clients are created with a Bitcoin library yeah. that are written absolutely from scratch, that uh, prove really solid and reliable, that that code base could actually just eventually at one point just replace the official client. That might be kind of interesting because there would have to be compatibility within clients and when we had Gavin on here he did touch up on that that the process is very slow because they have to do extensive testing yeah. because you know we're not just dealing with you know like LibreOffice or Ubuntu we're dealing with actual money right. a lot yeah. of money no room so for mistakes Exactly. There, yeah. any mistake could be catastrophic. And I don't think I don't think that the the whole point though is either way um, something's going to replace the code the the base code. Right. That's that's going to happen um, in time. Whether it's slowly being done and a lot of the things um, that this library does also might be able to be adaptable to the current code. Mm -hmm. It's not. Um, that's not. That's not really an issue. Also, the protocol is already in place. Right. The protocol is already in place. If I wanted to, to um, have a malicious uh, client, um, it's just simply going to be rejected by the network. So w what the whole client does, and the client, by the way, it's, it's not going to replace, it's not going to be closed source it's, or something. It's going to be open source. It's, um, the licensing is, is going to be very specific. That's something that, um, that Amir has extensively researched. We've, um, well, we're in talks now with, um, with a copyright specialist. Um, and that's that's not going to be a problem. This is a free thing, mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to be written in such a way that anyone that you know develops external code has to publish their mm -hmm. and, source um, code. So this is going to be a library, though, because we're jumping yeah. back and forth between library and client. And I just want to be sure because a client would be you know like a front end to JSON which is what the yeah. official Bitcoin client is and a library would usually be like a third party yeah but, but but that's the reason that the official I mean the the current client the is like that has nothing to do with the way it should be or the way it needs to be um, the reason it's like that is already sort of the problem that's the reason it's not versatile. That's the reason why progress is so slow. That's the reason why you need to be so um, careful about adding specific patches because you might have a domino effect. Mm -hmm. If you actually separate um, and, you know, the functionality and uh, have you know, a variable not be referenced throughout the code. Or modular. Yeah, yeah, if you actually have it modular, then this is a lot less of a concern. It's a, it's a lot better from a security point. Yeah. It's a lot better from pretty much every angle. And that's why people even, you know, the, the, you know a lot of the head developers um, are talking about, about this, you know, mm -hmm. to, to bring this as a move. Mm -hmm. So, so nothing is nothing's going to change. Right. But, um, but this is something that we're, we're trying to get support for. Basically, there's no reason to wait. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to, to slow this down. This is another thing that, you know, um, that starting back from square one again um, might make Bitcoin be adopted in two years as opposed to in 10 years. I'm talking about really mass adopted. Because, uh, you know, if you're talking to a businessman or if you're talking to, you know, whoever, and, and uh, I was talking to, you know, a journalist recently and he, and I found out he's been, he did already did an article about Bitcoin, pretty high profile guy. And uh, he hadn't even downloaded the, the Bitcoin client. Mm -hmm. And he says, let me see how it operates. Mm -hmm. You know, and I click on it and I have to wait a long time for the yeah. GUI just to pop up. Well, and then you had, like the first time we did it, remember? Oh, yeah, and he came over and, and he, went, he wanted to buy a Bitcoin. And yeah. so he actually, had he came over and he installed the client. Yeah. And then I sent the Bitcoin and we couldn't figure out why it wasn't showing up, why it wasn't showing up. And then finally, we, I, I was like, have, did you install that like recently? And he, it hadn't downloaded the yeah. entire blockchain and it doesn't tell you. 
Yeah. You're not going to see anything until the entire blockchain is downloaded. So it's of course. Free, free but, uh, but, so but yeah, and it's not, not friendly. First of all, yeah, you have to true, think. Though. But the thing is, these are more GUI-oriented stuff. Yeah. This is this is a totally different thing. User. But yeah. um, but even yeah, even from from that aspect, people should be able to customize it, and it could be probably relatively yeah. simple to do. Yeah. New users shouldn't be seeing the blockchain. Probably, what they should see is you're up to date, right. or something like that. You know, it's coming. Yeah, like on the way, yeah. some kind of a bar scale, something, and then and a, and a message that says you know you're not going to see any transactions until because if there's a lot, if there's a lot of numbers. Then this should, they're just going to be confused, they're going to dismiss you know, it, they're going to say gonna something I don't understand. the devil's advocate on this one because I think it's kind of good that it's that way now. This way we could work out any usability problems, scalability problems before it becomes so easy to use and so mainstream they'll gain wide adoptance. Yeah, okay, the problem, the problem is, is you can't, the now. That's, that's like actually a problem. These business clients, one of the clients is a you know, mobile service provider. Um, with uh, 13 million um, clients, and this was months ago that we started talking to this guy. Since then, you know, we've been talking to other people, and uh, and he says, oh, "Okay, well, this is not going to work. Yeah. So, what needs to be done?" So, the truth is, is that in terms of scalability, this needs to be done. Yeah. Uh, the 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 way that, uh, for instance, for instance, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but actually getting up to eight connections is a lot harder now, right, than it used to be. Um, is that still true? Because I haven't yeah, downloaded sure. the latest I, I've, I've been using it and I've had it consistently over 12 to 20 connections. Well, you have to have, what I you learned is you have to have the uh, UPnP enabled on yeah. your router. Because Which if you've only got eight connections, now. Yeah. okay, but I know, like before, if you, if you only have eight yeah. connections, then you don't have uh, port yeah. forwarding on. And that's bad. You actually yeah. want to turn port forwarding on. Exactly. It is a default really option now. It's on by default now. Yeah. Okay. So on that's one of that's version. one of the new features. But you also have to have your routers configured for UPnP. So Which go most your, most are now. By default, they're on. Um, usually they are. Usually now, how routers work is you connect it for the first time. And it has a startup wizard mm -hmm. and asks you all this stuff. Um, yeah. But there's a lot of information online because torrents use UPnP, games use UPnP. European so page universal plug idea. and play, so it's pretty yeah. universal. So you have to figure out if you, if you're not a geek, you got to figure out, read the manual, mm -hmm. read the documentation, figure out how to turn but on. But what's good product. about UPnP is that gamers use it, um, torrenters use it, a lot it's of people it, yeah. use it. You know, um, file shares and whatnot. Cool. So it's good that if it's open, your uh, the, yeah. the client uses it by default. Mm -hmm. Now I want to. I know a lot of these things are going to obviously they're yeah. just going to happen. But like, but like I said, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's yeah. a lot of issues. That's why a lot of the developers, a lot of the head developers, are, are all already have been talking for a while yeah. about a library as a long-term goal. Yeah. So that's true. But I want to I want to ask you something about something much more complex than the hardcore coding. <laughs> yeah. And that is the legal aspect. I shouldn't be talking about the hardcore coding. Yeah. Right now. You should talk to Amir about yeah, that. Right. But um, but this is the thing that really fascinates me. It's even even a bigger can of worms. Yeah. And that is the c compliance issues. Like, okay, so I've got lots of questions about that. So what because in our, li our limited time left, when we, okay, you have uh, exchange, uh, intersigngo.com, which is the, the euros, right? Yeah. And then you've got, um, you've got britcoin.com, which takes you to... Britcoin.co.uk. Okay, britcoin.co.uk. I think britcoin.com or was taken by a domain squatter or something like that? No, no, Brit. Uh, Bitcoin.com redirects you. Oh, really? Do we have that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, you have it. Yeah. Okay. Someone, it, someone has a domain. Uh, close. A domain. Someone squatted a domain name. Uh, probably, probably intersango.com or something like that. No, no, we have no, that one. Have That's okay. intersango.com euro. Mm -hmm. uh, intersango.us is um, is um, US what, dollars. Yeah, the US dollars mm -hmm. and and Bitcoin.co.uk. Is UV. But all you need to remember is intersango.com, and then we have the links that redirect. So now, now very soon we haven't the the layout isn't pretty. You know, mm -hmm. the best developers usually don't do the prettiest layouts. Mm -hmm. But um, like I said, we've been working on on uh, on new on a new code base and a, and a new everything. And uh, when that comes out, it's it's going to look much nicer, and the, it's going to be synthesized into one site. Oh, into one. Okay. So when you deal, all right. When you talk about compliance, you have an attorney, an attorney in the UK full time. You have, do you have an attorney in the US for the US compliance thing? Uh, no, we we don't have a, sp a attorney specific to us, but um, but I have spoken to an attorney. I don't know exactly what I'm privileged to spe specifically say with okay. regards to that. 
Okay, well, just from the from the user's perspective, um, what does a site? Because a lot of the site, maybe most of the sites, don't even. I mean, they have varying degrees of, of interest in compliance, apparently, yeah. you know, and they're in different countries and all that sort of thing. So, um, as a U.S. citizen, using yeah. interestangle.us, what, if you're in full compliance, what does that mean as a user? Does that mean that you're just like a bank? I have to show uh, documentation? No, this is, this is what it means. It doesn't matter if we're operating in an unregulated market. Mm -hmm. um, if we are facilitating money laundering, if we are facilitating... Uh, you know, the slew of, of illegal activity mm -hmm. um, and we're operating in a jurisdiction, mm -hmm. uh, we have to comply by those jurisdictions laws. Right. Now, the market itself is unregulated, right? Mm -hmm. Dealing Bitcoin, dealing with Bitcoins is unregulated, but certain other things are regulated. Um, so, for instance, banks already, they themselves have a lot of place, certain places and measures to stop money laundering. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes, sometimes they do a pretty bad job at it, actually. Um, but for the most part, you know, they, they do their homework. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things that they need to do. Uh, for this reason, we're not, go we're not going to be accepting deposits from various countries. We're not going to be deposit receiving deposits from <coughs> unwanted banks. We, of course, don't go pick up cash and then just, uh, you know, Put your now technically, if we got your passport, had you signed something, then we would be able to do that. Do we disclose this to the government? No. Um, if the government comes to us with a warrant, do we disclose it? Yes. Do we disclose what? What are you referring to? Um, that you would do that. If or? if someone if someone comes, mm -hmm. just just like anyone who's legally operating, mm -hmm. and uh, and if if you have a you know U.S dollar bank account. I think mm -hmm. to accept Douala, you have to have a U.S. bank account. Mm -hmm. I know that um, Empty Gox does have a business bank. I know that Trade Hill, right? Last yeah. I checked, does have. Yeah. And last I checked, Empty Gox does have a yeah. business bank account. Yeah. So, to, to, so to, to have that, you need to be operating within the laws of the land. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter if you're a French company or if you're based in Japan or whatever, or what right. your terms of conditions state. Um, and you need to be actively um, following, you know, the know certain protocols, and, and that right. mainly it's the know your customer. Right. Ninety-five percent of that is just following know your customer laws. So what does that mean? Okay, so back to this. Uh, I'm a consumer. I'm just an American guy. Yeah. So, uh, so if I go to interestango.us, does that mean that I'm, like when I go to the bank across the street, yeah. I mean I can bring in cash if I want, all the cash I want. Yeah. But I have to show my uh, government issued ID, and I have to prove my residence, like a, a, a lease or a utility yeah. bill to prove our. In fact. A bank uh, told me, a compliance officer told me that actually, according to Know Your Customer Law in the U.S., the bank, some officer of the bank has to actually visit your home. And they, the way they do it, I mean, it's technically part of the law. They have to actually visit your home or see it. So what they do is they send someone, I think they may pay someone, subcontract it, they have to drive past your address and make sure Weird. it's a residence. Yeah, or if it's a business account, actually no, it's a business account. If it's a business account, yeah. they had to actually visit the address and make sure that it was a business. They don't have to come up to your floor and knock on your yeah. door, but they have to drive past the address and make sure that it, it's a, a business. Yeah. yeah, so the know your customer laws and all this stuff are really, really, that's why I say it's a can of worms. So yeah. well, if, you, if you look at the history of poker sites, mm -hmm. these are offshore poker sites. Um, mm -hmm. They're operating from Isle of Man. I know PokerStars operating from Isle of Man. Yeah. And uh, what they had was, was they had payment processors I believe this is the version of the story, they, they, the official version, is they had payment processors who were operating in the U.S. Basically, you could take anything. You could take some pictures of chairs, like I was saying, yeah. um, and you could set up a website and you say, hey, I sell chairs. And then mm -hmm. you open a business bank account and uh, really it's the business bank account that you have set up for the payment processor and you send money from one to one, blah, blah, yeah. through these things, and then it eventually goes to the poker site. And the reason that um, it took so long for the US to crack down on these poker sites was because, again, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure, that's the uh, official, unofficial version of the story, <laughs> was because they wanted to link the people operating the poker sites to these, um, these uh, payment processors, mm -hmm. instead of just having some middleman, you know, uh, what do they call it? Um, instead of having some middleman scapegoat, mm -hmm. you know, and um, yeah. Patsy—that's right, what they right, call it, right? right. So. Okay, so all right, so 
that, that's how other things happen. So, but what I want to know is about intersango.us. Yeah. As a customer, am I going to have to prove my identity with a government issued ID? You just if you residence? if you send us a bank transfer, mm -hmm. that's enough proof. What if, if I, you use a pay, if you use Douala mm -hmm. or um, you know any of the payment processor, which is very legitimate. Right now, we're only accepting Douala and bank transfers. Oh, okay. Um, then, just then, that's, then, the then it's, yeah, it's just, it's just, just paying, piggybacking off of that. But we also, you know, have an entire auditing history. Mm -hmm. So if the government comes and says, you know, we have a warrant four months ago, this X Y Z, mm -hmm. um, then if You're then the, comply yeah, with otherwise, that. Mm -hmm. and the 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 negative, and people should like that. The negative thing would be was that if um, the government says, oh, you know, we have a warrant for X Y Z. Um, and we don't have the information, we can't provide the information readily, then what's going to happen is doesn't matter where we're based, doesn't matter what country we're based at, um, what happens is they freeze our bank accounts or they will have the authority to do that, I believe. And, um, and what ha this is what happened with the poker sites. And then what happens is that you have to appeal, for the poker sites you have to appeal to the Department of Justice and I assume it would be the same thing. You would have to appeal to the Department of Justice, and it's a six-month process, and maybe you get your money back. I don't know. What about um, your logs? Um, any logs that could be personally identifiable to people? How long are they held for? Well, actually, we, every, every transaction. See, what he's saying so is they're in complete compliance, which means they know your name and your address and your bank account, and they will always know it because that's what full compliance means. That's what full compliance is. And anyone who doesn't have those records, mm -hmm. and some people don't, mm -hmm. um, anyone who doesn't is, they're, they're is facing down a pretty scary road. Okay, so it's, it's interesting. Yeah, and this obviously this counteracts, I mean, it counters a lot of, the, um, you know, a lot of people have uh, strong feelings about financial privacy and so-called yeah. anonymity of Bitcoin and all these features or benefits yeah. of Bitcoin. And this obviously flies in the face of that. But that's because that's, that's the law. And you're saying you're now, really following... Now, when, um, when things are really bad mm -hmm. and when there's huge corruption, and I don't know if the reason Western Union charges $600 to send $3,000 from the Netherlands, mm -hmm. which is the first denominator in US dollars, to the UK and GBP. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the reason that they charge $600 is because of a corruption of licensing. Mm -hmm. I can't comment on that. Mm -hmm. But I know that that's not laissez-faire government. And I know that that's not just barrier to entry either. Mm -hmm. So when things are really that bad, I think everyone would support certain revolutions. This country, the US, was based on a revolution, which a lot of people in the UK at the time were against. Parliament was divided about the war, you know, um, against the US. But to continue, um, uh, the whole point is, is that that's why we created this um, open source software. If somehow Bitcoin does get licensed to a degree and it is manipulated, then uh, then people will be able to fight back, mm -hmm. and uh, and the thing is 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 I don't expect that happening in developed countries at all, mm -hmm. but I expect that happening in under undeveloped countries. I expect that happening in a place like Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine, yeah. you know, and uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing, right? Yeah, everywhere globally. So, so let me ask you this: So is um, is Intersango licensed then as a money transmitter? I mean, how do you decide? No, right now, any Bitcoin operation is unregulated. You don't need to get licensed, but you do need to follow, you know, um, certain compliances. But how do you know? I mean, you're, you're assuming that it's going to be considered a bank or a money transmittal or this or that. It doesn't it depend on the jurisdiction in that particular. It does. Dep it does right depend now? on the jurisdiction. But in the in Europe, there are certain precedents. Mm -hmm. In um, in the U.S., there are certain precedents as well, mm -hmm. and. Um, and in, in, in terms of the UK, we've actually been in contact and we had a, like I said, we, we've actually had, um, I don't know if it's something that's a ruling, it's not a ruling by the FSA, mm -hmm. but, um, but it's a very long and very detailed things about what compliance, we, what we need to do, mm -hmm. and uh, what laws we do need to follow. Not money transmitter is, money trans it's not a, mo it's not a money now. transmitter. 
But there's then they say that about eGold, and that's what they accuse them of because eGold. Uh, I don't know the very specifics of eGold, mm -hmm. but they didn't accuse. But but I but eGold was accused of money laundering. eGold was also accused of fraud. eGold and is operating a, yeah operating a money transmittal business without a license is what I read. Okay. Well, we could uh, we could put a um, a certain payment processor on our site or a payment API or whatever on our site mm -hmm. which would make us a money transmitting business. Mm -hmm. So there are certain things that we could do overnight to make us a money transmitting business, but we're not doing them. If you can you transmit dollars from one can a one user transmit dollars to another user? No. How about Bitcoin? Well, no. Not directly. No. Okay. All so right. these are these are specific things. These are features that other people have and maybe people like flocking to you know certain sites which add these features but these are not necessarily the smartest features to have Legal and not the right. safest features to have I don't want to comment on the legality of those specific things mm -hmm. maybe um, maybe you know certain other sites have looked into them but um, but I, I, I don't think there's so. There's always the technical aspects, the security yeah. aspects, and then there's the legal aspects. Yeah. And the legal aspects vary from place to place, too. In terms, and in mm -hmm. terms of franchising, this is why we're, we're not franchising. We're not going to allow someone else with um, no assets, mm -hmm. um, no capital, um, except for you know an amount of capital they give us, which they might be in charge of deposits magnitudes greater mm -hmm. in a month's time. Mm -hmm. We're not, you know, going to be trusting them with our brand. Okay. So if you see the name Intersango, and you see, you go to intersango.com. That's us. Right. Okay. Let me ask you this because we, we're we're short on time now, but I want to get to these things. You you're talking about um, not maybe not this version, but the next version. Yeah. Um, offering things like options. Um, it, are you going to op offer margin trading and options and things like that in this next? I'm version? not sure. This is a legal issue. Okay. And this is a legal issue that we're looking at, mm -hmm. and this is something that we may jurisdictionally split. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. So it's it's not just technical. Once again, it's legal issues. Yeah. Okay. So you're still researching the legal. What I was what I was saying about about those features mm -hmm. was that um, was that even even if and when we open source version two software, we will maybe even hope to keep keep those features closed source. The reason being is that um, it would sort of be not be criminally negligent, but it would be sort of negligent of us to allow people to sort of stab themselves in the stomach mm -hmm. legally, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Giving, it'd be sort of like giving people a gun. Mm -hmm. And um, we're trained on, on and I don't think, and I think that anyone who, who is a professional trader and is going to use those features responsibly anyway, they're going to be able to find a reliable site doing that. And anyone who isn't should probably have enough capital or look into it before, mm -hmm. before it, it shouldn't be so easy for them. Okay. So, sorry. Just like more. it shouldn't be so easy for a person to get a gun. Right. You know? <laughs> Cooling up here. A couple more quick questions because we're almost out of time. Um, the, the, for example, the U.S. site, can non-U.S. Uh, citizens or non-U.S. residents uh, create an account or is it only for the U.S.? You have to have a U.S. bank account. Okay. Or so you have to be able to use Dwala. Okay. If you're not a U.S., do you have, do you have to... Or, do now, you we may be extending that to Canada mm -hmm. soon, but, mm -hmm. um, but really we're also looking at the adv advantages. It's always advantageous to use the exchange in your region. Okay. And what about our, our IRS declarations done on, on capital gains? If somebody keeps money in there, and it, yeah. or Bitcoin, and it grows in value, or um, is Intersanga going to report the that to the IRS if it's a you know for capital gains? Well, we don't we don't um, you know if they if if we don't we aren't required to report anything, but anyone who's served with a warrant is required to report mm. whatever. Required to report anything? It's an it's an it's an unregistered business. No. Well, there are certain things we're 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 and required to report tra transaction of cert of a certain amount mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But um, we're setting up an email system as well to notify spe people of the specifics. Of what's going on. So that's yeah. that's people wow. need to need to look into everything. But it's the same thing that any legally operating any you know business bank account is going to need to do. Okay, one last question. We got only seconds left. 
are you going to publish these, this legal body of work, like recommendations for somebody so that they know how to be in compliance if they want to set up their own site with this software so that a, a young guy who wants to set up yeah. their own site, that you, he can follow the recommendations, at least guidelines of what you um, know. That's, that takes on tons of legal liability mm -hmm. and I'm not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, our lawyer, Jason Chia, Mm -hmm. He's uh, he has a website of his own. Um, it's going to be linked from our consultancy site, okay. and he might be able to give free advice. Mm -hmm. um, we also have been in contact, but I don't know if I can public publicize mm -hmm. some of the the things we have because they're not actual public declarations. They're okay. just declarations to us. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, the, I'm in the process of asking if we can make those public. These okay. emails that we've had. Interesting. All right, we're out of time. We already ran out of time. It's right. We're going to have to do this again. But um, we? we're out right of time. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> we'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you. 2 p.m. Eastern. Thanks for joining us on the Bitcoin Show. Talked a little bit longer about that. Uh